at uh, noon central time, and we've been uh, staying on time with each of the presenters. I really appreciate that. And uh, very uh, excited about our afternoon session. Uh, I think we've described the COBRI funding mechanism pretty well and uh, addressing the need for more research infrastructure in states like North Dakota. <clears throat> so the purpose of the COBRI is for faculty development. And we just have a tremendous team of early career faculty members that are working on uh, the Indigenous Health PhD and or working on the uh, Indigenous Trauma and Resilience Research Center. So uh, again, our pro program started about a year ago, but we've had some limitations in enrolling subjects because of the pandemic, kind of a, a national and worldwide challenge right now with research. But our researchers have some tremendous experience and background and really good research projects that they'll be sharing with you this afternoon. So we'll start with uh, Dr. Andrew Williams. He, uh, he's originally from uh, Watertown, South Dakota, so knows this region very well and had worked actually at the Center for Rural Health here at UND before going back to graduate school. And he has his PhD in maternal and child health from the University of Maryland and a Master of Public Health and Community Public Health from New York University. <clears throat> and we're just uh, very honored to have him on our team, and he'll be sharing his uh, research project on the COBRI. So Andrew, I'll go ahead and hand it over to you. Thank you, Don. And I'll just go ahead and share my screen here quick. All right, well, thanks everyone for attending. Um, see the participants kind of start ticking back up after everyone gets back from lunch. Today, I'm just going to share uh, kind of a quick overview of my study, which is stress and health in American Indian pregnancies. And um, we haven't quite started yet, but hopefully in the summer, we will be able to start recruiting participants, which is going to be a similar story, I think, for everybody's uh, presentation today. Before I get into the actual study, just want to recognize some of the research team that you aren't hearing from today. Obviously, everyone here at UND was pretty involved in contributing to the design of the full COBRI, uh, but these four individuals have been critical so far and will be critical for the success of this project moving forward. Uh, first is Lynn Messer, who is Associate Professor and Assistant Dean at Portland State University. She's been a collaborator of mine, is also a perinatal epidemiologist, um, and serves as the project mentor, um, including some of her work on structural determinants of health. She's also done some work with the indigenous population in Portland. Um, secondly is Amy Stiffarm. She is Ani from Montana and is the research assistant on the study. And she's also a PhD student in our PhD program here. Um, and she's been integral to some of the modifications that we've made um, over the course of the last year, which I'll talk about later in my presentation. And then both Kate Larson and James Romich are from the USDA Grand Forks Human Nutrition Research Center. This is the lab that we will be doing, <clears throat> excuse me, our analysis at for our hair samples that I'll talk about. And they were both really integral in um, designing some of the hair sampling procedures. Obviously, all of the biochemical analyses that goes on is something that is way outside of my field of expertise, but they're the ones that are going to be leading that. And um, they've been really great also working on some of the revisions of that IRB committees have asked me to make as well. So I just wanted to recognize these four people since you won't be hearing from them today. A little bit of background of the study. Um, between 2000 and 2015, Cardiovascular disease remained one of the leading causes of mortality among indigenous populations in the United States. And during that 15 year period, uh, the rate of cardiovascular disease mortality actually increased among indigenous populations. However, it declined or plateaued among most other racial ethnic groups in the United States. So sort of this persistent and seemingly worsening problem. Now, during this time, at this point, um, I think this uh, American Heart Association statement is probably five or six years old now, um, but there's a recent call out for specifically looking at stress among pregnant women and what that means for cardio cardiovascular risk factors among their infants. And they specifically looked at needing more research on things like pathways and modifiers in the association between stress, which was pretty broadly defined there, and infant health. 
We also know that there's a strong body of evidence suggesting that accelerated growth during infancy is associated with cardiovascular disease in adulthood. Um, some of you may be familiar with the Barker hypothesis and developmental origins of health and disease. That's where a lot of my work in general comes from, and that's one of the big kind of contributing factors to this study. And there is evidence specifically among indigenous populations that has linked infant growth to worsening cardiovascular health already in children at ages five to eight years old. Um, so we know that there's this background of evidence to suggest that there's something going on, but no one's actually done the study yet. Now, Dr. Ward talked uh, a little bit about this this morning, but I'll be primarily focused on adverse childhood experiences in the study. And uh, there is some literature out there suggests that there, there is this association between ACEs and poor obstetric outcomes and also low birth weight, which is essentially proxy for fetal growth. Um, but as of right now, ACEs as a determinant of infant growth have been underexplored and unexplored, and especially in indigenous populations in North America. And we know that this is a particular interest to our region because in North Dakota, approximately half of pregnant indigenous women have been exposed to multiple ACEs compared to only about 35% of white women in the state. Now, in terms of adversity, stress, and potential mediators, there's really a lack of evidence in terms of that biologic pathway of why does adversity and why does stress actually link up with infant growth. So we'll be able to look at a variety of different potential mediators. Um, cortisol, those of you that are familiar with that, is a, a well-known stress hormone, and we'll be looking at concentrations of that. But they're also going to consider things like obstetric health outcomes, so preeclampsia, gestational diabetes, um, weight gain during pregnancy. And then kind of the delivery and infant side of things will be examined as well. So birth weight, small for gestational age, and infant feeding practices in that first year of life. So really what we're going to try to do is, is look at this interrelation of maternal ACEs, stress, maternal health, and infant feeding, and how these relate to infant growth, um, because they really haven't been explored in any population, and this is definitely one of the, the areas that, to date, we haven't been able to really find anything about Indigenous populations in the U.S., and I think there hasn't been much done in, on Indigenous populations worldwide in terms of the, these specific questions. So now getting into the specifics of this study, um, our first aim, is we're going to be looking at the association between high levels of maternal ACEs and maternal cortisol levels during pregnancy. So this is going to give us some picture of a biologic response to chronic stressors or, or, or past adversity. Um, so we'll be able to do this by looking at hair, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. So building off of this aim, we're then going to be looking at the high ACEs, and then start to examine some of those maternal and obstetric outcomes. So that's going to include things like gestational diabetes, which is also an issue faced by uh, specifically the indigenous population in North Dakota. There's a big disparity in terms of gestational diabetes, but also things like preeclampsia, um, you know, other adverse outcomes among the mom during pregnancy as well. And then we'll also be able to bring in some of the the infant data or the, at least the birth data for this aim and think about those as, as the outcomes. And lastly, building off the first two aims, um, we're gonna be taking a look at high levels of maternal ACEs and whether, if or how they're associated with infant growth. And we'll be able to take a look at a couple different time periods with our study design, um, considering both six months growth and 12 month growth. And then we'll have a range of different potential mediators that we'll look at as well. So obstetric outcomes, cortisol, and infant health and infant feeding. Now, a little bit of a more just visual look at what this looks like. Uh, moving from left to right, you can kind of see how we're going to be building out these analyses and building out these aims. And there are obviously, it's probably a little bit easier to see here than, than the previous slide, areas that we could potentially inform some sort of intervention, modify behaviors, et cetera. Um, especially when you start thinking about the maternal and obstetric outcomes, what can we do in terms of early identification of high-risk people, maybe even before they're, they're pregnant? Um, then obviously infant feeding. Uh, Dr. Warren sort of already covered some of the historic issues in terms of infant feeding in indigenous populations, really thinking about formula distribution centers and you know putting sugar water into formula feeding um, decades ago. Um, and some of that has, has carried over, and there's also implications in terms of the 
kind of the cultural importance of breastfeeding and how that has somewhat been lost both through that combination of historic trauma through things like colonization, boarding schools, and those WIC programs that were kind of knowingly giving poor health advice to, to Indigenous populations. Um, so is there some action that can be done here? So to achieve these aims, we are going to be working with three different sites, which I'll get to here in a little bit, to enroll 375 to about 400 pregnant Indigenous people. And this is prior to 36 weeks gestation. So yes, that's a little bit late in pregnancy. However, in North Dakota, we know that Indigenous women have at least two times high, higher risk than other groups um, to receive no or late prenatal care. And in conversation with tribal IRB officials at um, Standing Rock and Turtle Mountain, this is one of the changes that they suggested as we were going through this process is, you know, we know that we have difficulty seeing American Indian women early on in pregnancy in most situations in North Dakota. So let's make sure we can kind of gather the data that we can um, for this study. Then we are planning on following up the parent and the baby up to 12 months postpartum. And this is a really important time frame for growth and development. There's lots of you know, social, emotional things that go on as well between the, the dyad. Um, but there's also really important outcomes for postpartum health. So even though my main outcome is focusing on infant health, we're going to be collecting a lot of data on the moms. Um, so that way we're, we're getting a good understanding of ACEs and maternal health in that context of pregnancy and postpartum. And we'll be uh, collecting data at three, oh, four time points, but three study visits. I'll show you uh, a graph here in a little bit. Um, so it's going to be 36 weeks or, or earlier gestation. We'll also get some data during delivery, but that's all medical record stuff. And then we'll be seeing mom and baby at six months and at 12 months postpartum. And there's going to be a hair sample, self-report uh, self survey, and then medical records are going to be the source of all of our data. And I'll go over kind of the key measures. I'm not going to go through my whole entire survey for you, but you'll get a good sense of what the measures are we're collecting um, from our participants. Now, in terms of our study sites, um, we wanted to try to capture some of that diversity among the indigenous population that we know exists in the state of North Dakota. And so we have three different study sites. The one that we are thinking is actually probably gonna get started first is the Altru site here in Grand Forks. Um, then we're also working with the Burdick Memorial Healthcare Facility in Turtle Mountain, and then the Fort Yates Hospital in Standing Rock. And one of the nice things about having these three study sites is that there's going to be a variety of participants in terms of tribal affiliation. Um, with the Grand Forks site, we're going to pick up a little bit more of a more urban population. Um, but then if you notice, Spirit Lake Reservation is the closest to Grand Forks. And one of the realities of, of life in North Dakota is that you have to travel for healthcare often. Um, and so there's a lot of people from Spirit Lake and the Devil's Lake area that birth and seek care in Grand Forks. So even though we don't have a third truly tribal site, um, we should actually be getting quite a few people from the Spirit Lake area um, that are collected at a Grand Fork site. So we're gonna have a little bit of that urban, rural reservation diversity, and then also um, hopefully quite a bit of diversity in terms of tribal affiliation as well. Now I'm just gonna walk through some of the key measures over a couple of sites just to kind of show like what we're doing and what we're interested in. Um, so the first one is the hair sample. And the pictures here on the left are from a manual that the, uh, um, USDA lab has, has put together in terms of training procedures. So you can see that they um, collect the hair sort of from the, the back of the head. And well, it looks like we, we take a lot of it. We really only need about three centimeters. Um, and so we'll talk about some of that on this slide and, and later on as well. So hair cortisol concentration has been validated as a measure of chronic stress. Um, so this has been validated against sal uh, salivary cortisol, which is typically what we, how we collect a lot of cortisol, especially in a lot of epidemiologic studies. Um, this has been shown to be sensitive to chronic stress, and it's also been validated among uh, pregnant people. So we know that this should be a pretty good measure for us to get an understanding of that, um, a, a more chronic version of stress. 
So for our hair samples, um, they need to be approximately three millimeters in diameter and at least three centimeters in length. And it's taken as close to the scalp as possible from the posterior vertex position. Um, so you can see in the pictures here, they, they cut it without, without taking the root out. So they're really just the, the strands of hair as close as, uh, to the scalp as they can get. Um, and so this will provide us with a concentration of about three months. So we'll get sort of that longer term measure of cortisol to give us a understanding of sort of that circulating cortisol level in the body. Um, and a method very similar to this will be developed or has been developed for use among infants. So we'll be able to collect the hair samples from the babies as well. And then because there's some concerns about, um, you know, sunlight, hair products, washing, et cetera, part of the analysis is also going to incorporate some of uh, hair sample supplement questions that we have as part of our survey. So we'll have an understanding of, you know, what products are going in people's hair on a regular basis, hair color, sun exposure, all of that. Um, so that'll be able to, we'll be able to kind of adjust for those exposures along the way. Now, in terms of our survey measures, we have a pretty robust survey that, that people are going to be filling out, um, but there's really just these main measures of interest. So there's some exposures and some, some potential mediators here, here as well. Um, but the first one that, that we're going to be focusing on is adverse childhood experiences. Um, so it's, you know, those 10 standard questions that I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with over those first 18 years of life. And this has been used among a variety of populations. Um, we're also going to collect the historic losses scale. And this is self-reported 12 measures designed to measure frequency in which American Indian people think about historic loss. So things like colonization, things like uh, past trauma in their family and in their community. And this has been designed specifically to be used among um, indigenous populations in the United States. And I think this might be one of the first studies to use this among pregnant people. Um, I'm not 100, I, off the top of my head, I can't remember because um, it has been a little while since we decided to use this. Um, then we're also going to be looking at the perceived stress scale. This is a measure that will be repeated during the study. Um, and it's a self-report measure of about 10 items thinking about stressful events over the past month. Um, I use this in other projects I'm working on. And so as an aside, hoping to be able to actually combine some different studies to take a better look at how perceived stress looks at various different groups in the United States. And then for our infant feeding measure, this is going to be maternal report at both six and 12 month postpartum. Um, and it's going to be asking about initi initiation and duration of breastfeeding, introduction of solid foods. There's also some infant health questions that we have there as well. And then our main outcome of interest for the study is infant growth. And as part of well child checks in that first year of life, we're going to be able to get length, weight, and head circumference um, from those medical records. And we're going to be calculating age and gender specific Z scores at birth, six months, and 12 months based on the CDC um, standardized charts for, for infants. And then for the rate of growth, we'll be just comparing Z scores from birth and then six and 12 months. And um, essentially, a higher change in Z score is going to be the poor outcome since that increased growth during that first year of life is really where we see some of those issues later on in life. Now, thinking about sort of the timeline of where things look, just wanted to show you where we're going to be collecting all these different measures. Um, so during the first study visit, that one that happens before 36 weeks gestation, this is where we're going to be collecting ACEs data and um, historic loss data and some of the um, some, some additional mental health and um, trauma and resilience measures as well. And the reason that we're only collecting ACEs at this first study visit is because a lot of those questions can potentially be re-traumatizing for people. So we know we need, need to collect it at some point during the study. Um, so we're just going to do it once at the beginning. Then we won't have to repeat those questions later on. Um, as you can see, there's going to be survey measures that includes lots of demographics, uh, father questions, baby health questions at three different times during the study. We'll also be collecting that hair sample three different times from the mom, medical records at each study visit, as well as the delivery. And then for the baby, we'll hopefully be able to collect hair sample at six and 12 months. Um, you know, if we have a baby that doesn't have much hair, hopefully we'll get at least some hair by 12 months. Um, but, you know, it's up to the baby how much hair they grow on that, on that first year. So we'll, we'll kind of take what we can get in terms of that one. Um, 
but we'll also be able to get some of those anthro anthropometry measures at six and 12 months as well and be able to compare that to um, birth size from the medical records. Now to quickly just kind of walk through the analysis plan, so this is kind of help you just get an understanding of what we're doing, all these measures and sort of where some of the important scientific discoveries will be. Um, and this first one, we'll be looking at the maternal ACEs and cortisol levels during pregnancy. And so this is just gonna be cross-sectional examination. So it's data from the enrollment visit. Um, and this is gonna be pretty standard linear regression models where we're just gonna be looking at maternal ACE scores and cortisol concentration. Um, and this is really gonna be sort of giving us that baseline understanding of what trauma and cortisol levels during pregnancy looks like for indigenous people, specifically Northern Plains indigenous people. Um, but like I said, should we think it's gonna be the first time this question has been asked among indigenous populations in the United States. Um, and given that we don't know a lot about some of the physiologic responses to stress at the sort of internal how is the body functioning type level, this is gonna be really important for understanding the effect of stress and trauma as we move forward. Then for AIM-2, we'll be looking at ACEs collected early on and then looking at those poor outcomes of the mom um, and potential mediation by cortisol levels. So we're looking at longitudinal metals, so we, models so we can um, take into account that change in, in, in time and uh, like I said, looking at a range of different outcomes here, we'll be using survey data and medical records. Um, then we'll potentially be looking at whether or not cortisol concentration mediates the relationship between ACEs and these different outcomes. But if we can't find anything with the cortisol, we're going to have a couple other things in our back pocket we can look at in terms of um, stress. So we have that perceived stress measure that we're going to be collecting um, that will give us some sense of what stress looks like in our study population. Um, but then we can also potentially look at other biologic measures like blood pressure um, and pre-existing hypertension and all those types of things as well. And then lastly, for we're looking at maternal ACEs and infant outcomes, um, again, we're gonna be looking at longitudinal measures. And this is what we'll be looking at infant growth at both um, the typo here, uh, birth and then six and 12 months as well. And again, we'll be able to look at mediation analyses with cortisol concentration, and then importantly, things like obstetric complications and infant feeding. Looking at those potential mediators will give us some data as to whether or not these are actually potentially modifiable places that we can improve infant health um, and maybe you know work on having healthier pregnancies lead to healthier babies, and then obviously some of the infant feeding and health behaviors in that postpartum period and what that looks like for infant health. Now, this was the original design. A lot of that that I just presented you was originally thought of two and a half years ago now before we submitted everything. Um, but then everything changed like six weeks after we submitted the grant. Um, so we had this interruption. There have been no enrolled participants quite yet, but we were able to kind of take advantage of the pandemic a little bit um, in terms of what I've been calling a, a sort of a pandemic silver lining. Um, we were able to kind of revisit our study design and different aspects of our approach and see what we can do, see if we can make things a little bit better. So we did actually add all true system as a study site during the pandemic. Um, as I've already said, this is going to add more of an urban population, hopefully be able to include some Spirit Lake residents. And then there might be some additional diversity and tribal representation um, at the all true site here as well. And one interesting thing about the all true site um, I've been able to work with them a little bit closely lately and get some uh, some data as to terms of how the study is going to look like in their population. Um, and if you remember, when we we're designing this study and, and consult with the tribal officials, they were like, we have a terrible time getting people in early for prenatal care. Um, so then sort of a natural question is, well, what about these the kids? Are the, are, are the kids showing up to the study? Can we actually have the kids be born here and then seen here during their, their well-child visit? And the answer is yes. In all true, in 2021, 93% um, of Indigenous babies born at all true had at least one well child follow up at all true here in Grand Forks. And that was the question I asked. But in reality, the vast majority of those 93% adhere to that well child schedule very, very well. So we do have a good understanding that people are bringing their kids back, regardless of what their prenatal care experience was like. 
kids are coming back to, to um, get their care and pretty well on schedule. So in terms of a study design aspect, we're pretty comfortable with that. Now, we also were able to sort of sit back and say, well, what are we gonna do with this hair sample? Um, you know, we're gonna have excess hair sample. We only need three centimeters. Um, and if we're gonna be cutting off long lengths of hair, you know, can we keep it for additional al uh, analyses? Where are we gonna store it? Who's gonna take care of it? All those types of things. And obviously we started running into some ethical and cultural concerns with storing hair samples. Um, not only is there that history of non-indigenous researchers taking you know, biologic specimen from indigenous populations and not treating them appropriately, um, but then we also had, you know, who's gonna store it? Are we gonna send it back to the tribes and all those types of things? So kind of an ongoing question that we had with IRB review. Um, and the person who really kind of figured out what we're gonna do is Amy Stiffarm the student who's working with me on the study. Um, she's actually done some hair sample projects before. So she was like, hey, why don't we just give them their hair back? We were like, duh, we don't need to keep hair around. All we need is three centimeters. Um, so what we're going to do is we're gonna be able to give participants their hair back at the time that we collect it. So we're gonna just put it right into the vial, snip off what we have, and then participants will be able to leave the study visit with their hair. So that kind of gets around a few different issues that we raised. First of all, it gives power back to the participants over their biologic specimen. Um, so in general, the more power participants can have is great. But then given the potentially cultural importance of, of hair in many indigenous communities, then those participants will be able to dispose of their hair how, how they see fit. Um, and so that way, that issue is kind of taken care of as well. So whatever is appropriate in terms of what that participant wants, they'll be able to do that with their hair. And then it also kind of solves some of those logistic issues we were worried about, like how are we gonna store the hair? When are we gonna be shipping things back? You know, this, that, and the other thing. Um, and in terms of what we do collect for analysis, that all gets destroyed during the analytic process. So this really leaves us with no excess hair sample whatsoever. Um, we were also able to add in a telemedicine component to our surveys, and this is really driven by the pandemic and, and sort of the explosion of telemedicine in the sort of broader medical field, especially mental health. Um, so we're going to be asking some questions about have they been using telemedicine for themselves and their family? How often do they have internet access, cell phone access, et cetera? Um, then also another exciting thing, you sort of already seen part of this in a slide, is that we were able to figure out a, an artwork licensing agreement for all of our study designs. Um, so this is the image, it's called My Dear Sweet Baby, um, and it is by Lauren Goodday, who is um, part of the three affiliated tribes here in North Dakota, and also Sweetgrass Cree First Nation in Saskatchewan. Um, and she herself is a mother, Indigenous woman living in her community. Um, and her artwork has actually been kind of all over the country, all over the world, et cetera. So we're very excited to be able to execute this agreement with her and um, we'll be incorporating some of these really nice images in our materials in the future. Um, and I talked about just sort of some of the innovative steps of this study. This will, will be the first longitudinal examination of maternal ACEs and biomarkers of stress and obstetric outcomes that we know of, regardless of indigenous population or not. We're also be able to establish some indigenous specific patterns of HPA or stress activity and infant growth to help better understand those health indicators in, in this population. We're also gonna be able to explore a lot of different mediators between ACEs and infant growth. And, and as I've already said, hopefully they can inform some interventions in the future. And then lastly, hopefully working with community and conducting this research, um, we'll be able to lead to new approaches, models, and best practices for the future. And we've already done that with the hair sample. Um, so we've already talked about like, we should probably at least write this up in, in some form and send that out um, to get published somewhere. And lastly, just a couple minutes left, wanted to mention how this connects to some other work that's going on and what the future looks like. Um, there's a, a women's health research supplement for idea states and COBRE recipients that's due in fall 2022. And so it's sort of a natural potential for, for this project. And I've already talked with some students about potential interest and what that might look like. I'm also working with uh, North Dakota Pregnancy Risk Assessment Monitoring System data. And we're really looking at the impact of the pandemic on different racial disparities in the state, especially in terms of access to prenatal care, breastfeeding, domestic violence, ACEs. 
So this is all sort of has already informed some of the direction of, of the COBRI study as well. Also working on a study looking at stress and placental function. Um, and this is also a longitudinal examination that's giving us a better idea of that biologic response to stress and the biologic implications of stress. And so once we start getting a better picture of that longitudinal effect of stress, hopefully be able to pull these studies together for, for kind of the next steps and next projects. And then I'm also waiting to hear back from the NIH on an application I put in for their uh, loan repayment application in which we'll be looking at telehealth and pregnancy outcomes among American Indian women in North Dakota. This would be a combination of some of the PRAMS work I'm doing, also some of the data that we'll be collecting for this study. And we're essentially trying to figure out, can indigenous people more easily access prenatal care and thus reducing some of those disparities in early prenatal care and, and obstetric outcomes in, in this population? Um, and seeing if telemedicine and some of those other virtual aspects of care can at least get them in the door, quote unquote, um, earlier on in pregnancy. So that's really what I've been uh, up to the last year. So I know I only have like a minute or so for questions. So, um, but you can also always email me questions and uh, always open to collaborations as well. So thank you very much. Great job, Andrew. Really appreciate uh, the, the summary and it's considering the limitations of the pandemic, that is some really good progress uh, moving forward. And I, I like how you're linking it to other projects and the importance of looking at it more holistically. It looks like we do have a couple of hands up. We'll start with uh, Kathy. Um, you'd like to ask your question. Hi, uh, well, I had a, a couple of quick questions. Um, one, you mentioned that you don't re-ask about, you know, ACE during the follow-up visits, but do you ask about current uh, trauma or that type of thing, psychological stress? Yes, we are going to be looking at um, a few different types of uh, stress mental health questions over time. And those tools that we're using, like perceived stress scale, um, patient health questionnaire, generalized anxiety disorder, those are designed to be a month to two weeks. Um, so we'll be able to kind of track if that changes over time. And we do recognize that, you know, repeating some of these questions themselves can increase anxiety um, when thinking about them. So we do, we do have that built in and, and we'll be able to connect people with resources if they have any issues. But in terms of the design of the questionnaire, we've kind of spaced things out enough that hopefully it's not going to be um, an issue for a lot of people, but that, you know, there, there's always sort of that potential risk. And, and but then also you get the uh, but you you will you are what I'm hearing is you are assessing uh, current stress in other yes. words um, yep. yes yep. Uh, the other thing at some point um, but it could be a confine a confounder so I've actually designed a project looking at education pre and post um, delivery uh, to help kids get into a process of you know long term educational goals. Um, I may talk to you at some point, but it may interfere because people that are following that program might be healthier in general. Do you know what I'm saying? So we can chat though. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thanks. Excellent questions and uh, always looking forward to additional collaboration. That sounds wonderful. And we have one more question from uh, Thomasine Heitkamp. Uh, just, just wanted to say how impressed I am with uh, the process of gathering the data and the potential for really good outcomes. And as a social worker, the importance of sharing this data cross-disciplinary with social workers, with people working in domestic violence centers, with public health officials. So I look forward to seeing the findings. Yeah, thank you, Thomasine. And yeah, through some of my other work um, where I already have the data, like for the PRAMS, we are um, collaborating with um, well, Ray Ann Anderson from uh, Psychology here in, at, at UND, she does a lot of work on sexual violence and domestic violence. So we're trying to already reach out and broaden who we're working with and, and those populations as well. So definitely excited to, to broaden that, that up. So um, thank you very much. Yeah, if anyone else has any questions, I know my email's um, on the slides and I think also on the, the, web, the, the web page. So don't want to take up any more time from, I don't remember who's next, but the next presentation. So thank you very much. Great, that was just outstanding, Andrew, really appreciate it. And, and we can see the importance of this type of work because when we look at uh, data like average age at death, it's so low in North Dakota for American Indians. We, we have looked at the data for the, the decade prior to the pandemic and average age at death 
for American Indians is about 54 as compared to nearly 80 for the general population. And certainly uh, infant mortality and related problems are driving a lot of those numbers. So important work. Well, next up we have Dr. Ursula Running Bear. She's an enrolled member of the Shichangu Lakota community from Rosebud, South Dakota. She has her PhD in clinical science from the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus, also has a master's degree in sociology from the University of Arizona. And she worked at University of Colorado um, for about 17 years before we were able to steal her away to have her join us here at University of North Dakota. And she's done some really innovative work around the long-term impact of American Indian boarding school participation. So Dr. Running Bear, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks. So you can see my screen, right? Yeah, we can see it just fine. Okay, great. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. So like Dr. Warren said, I'm Ursula Running Bear. Um, I am the second project in the overall COBRE grant, and I do look at the impact of American Indian boarding schools on perceived stress, allostatic load, and resilience. This actually builds off of, as Dr. Warren mentioned, some of my previous work where I looked at the relationship of chronic health conditions and boarding school attendance. And that study is actually available on PubMed for free if anyone is interested in looking at it. So I'm sorry, I just need to rearrange my screen here a little bit. So I thought I'd give just a little bit of a roadmap of where we're going in this presentation. And so I will briefly talk about boarding schools and some boarding school experiences. I'm not gonna go into great detail on these, but I will describe some of them. And I'm going to talk about the study purpose and aims, the setting and partners, study design variables, and then overview of the procedures and then also talk about the study changes that I've made. And actually, as I'm giving the presentation, I'll point out places where I've made changes in collaboration with my partners. And then I'll end by talking about where we're at right now. So American Indian boarding school attendance was compulsory. And at one point in time, it's estimated that between 80 and 83 percent of American Indian children of school age were in boarding schools. And the purpose was a complete and full assimil assimilation of all aspects of our life. So our language, culture, spirituality, dress, food, even the way that we wear our hair. So children were required to attend and sometimes they were forcibly removed from their families. So they would go around in community to community, family to family, picking up the children. Non-compliant parents were punished through withholding food rations and in some cases imprisonment. Now the withholding of food rations is interesting because particularly in my previous work in the Northern Plains, treaties included provisions for food. And so now in this instance, these treaty rights are being used as a way to force parents to send their children to school. So the diets at boarding school were high in sugar, starch, fat. They lacked fresh fruits, vegetables, meat. Um, there was also a lack of healthcare and trained professionals. And so what this meant is that when children were ill, sometimes they went untreated. And also those that um, were providing healthcare may not have been well-trained and lacked skill. So there also was overcrowding in boarding schools. And this was primarily because they wanted to keep enrollment up so that the funding could keep coming in. So overcrowding was something that was practiced. Practiced the um, structures themselves were unsafe. There were unsanitary conditions, poor heating, and poor ventilation. So children were removed about the age of six, and that was the policy around the age of six. Sometimes it was 
an older age, just sometimes it was a younger age, but it was right around six and that's what the policy said. So there is documented and research, historical accounts, testimonials, and even interviews that you can find online, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, psychological and physical abuse. So if we think about the emotional and the psychological abuse, this could take the form of extreme ridicule, shame, and embarrassment. Oftentimes, boarding schools were run by churches, so therefore church attendance was required. And there was a lack of interaction with family. And so this is a twofold lack of interaction. So when the child was sent off to boarding schools, they did not have interaction with their parents or other adult uh, relatives. And um, they also had limited access with other siblings or relatives that they may have been sent off to school with. They separated the boys from the girls and they also separated based on age. And so I actually know someone who attended boarding school with her uh, siblings and very rarely saw them. So children were not allowed to practice their culture, their language, or their spirituality. These actually, along with other minor infractions, could result in corporal punishment, which was used to enforce all of the rules in the boarding school. So this could take on things like um, beating, solitary confinement, and withholding of food. And these are just a few examples. There were also prisons inside some of the boarding schools or on some of the boarding school campuses, and they were used, children did die inside of them. Um, and also one of the other things that is documented in historical records is that students were forced to participate in the punishment of other students who broke the rules. So this could be the part of the ridicule, it could be actually part of beatings and floggings as well. So the purpose of my study is to look at whether allostatic load, which is a measure of chronic stress, is worse in American Indian boarding school attenders compared to non-attenders. So as we can see, based on the last two slides, young children were um, exposed to some pretty harsh environments at a really young age. So the study aims, the first aim is to determine the relationship of boarding school attendance and then each of these control variables. So really the intention behind aim one is to look at the relationship relationship of each of the control variables, these variables, as well as the relationship to the outcome, chronic stress, and then also the exposure, which is boarding school attendance. So that's the first aim. The second aim is really the primary aim, and it's to test whether boarding school attenders have more chronic stress than non-attenders. And I will be controlling for variables in aim one, and I will just briefly talk about the variables in an upcoming slide. So I want to talk just a little bit about my partners. So when I, um, so I first got here in October of 2019, I was asked to write this grant, which was due in January of 2020. So I um, kind of put it together pretty quickly, but after um, learning a little bit more about the tribal variation in the state and variation with boarding schools, I decided to focus in on only one reservation in North Dakota. And this is one of the larger ones. It has a, one of the larger land masses and also the, one of um, the larger populations. And so that was kind of one pivot that I had to make is to um, approach a tribe and see if they wanted to work with me, try to convince them to work with me. Um, and then, um, you know, just that whole collaboration process had to take place. So part of our discussions was that they, um, they wanted to include areas near the reservation. So in the original grant, I actually had listed several 
urban areas and towns across the state of North Dakota, because that was my primary intention to try to kind of do broad recruitment. But when we were meeting and they were reviewing the grant and looking at the measures and everything else, they, they said, you know, we really want these areas included. So that was one change that we made was to include some of the towns and urban areas that they wanted. So it is a self-identification. Let me just back up and say that they found that they wanted, they found that <laughs> they thought it was important that individuals on the reservation as well as those living in close proximity be included in the study. And so it is a self-identification. We're not asking people to prove their tribal enrollment. So I am working with one uh, a tribe and two tribal college faculty, but actually the faculty at the tribal college aren't necessarily responsible for doing research. So they have so far actually been volunteering their time since last summer, meeting with me regularly to talk about the study and how we're going to roll it out. So, and they, actually they've been just so invaluable um, in just the whole process. And I'll talk a little bit about that too. So the other part is that we are going to use tribal college students to collect the data. So they have an opportunity to participate in the data collection process. Oh, and the one thing um, I do wanna say, cause it's not on here, is that I'm not disclosing the name of the tribe. And this is because we've talked a little bit about it, but we haven't come to a determination as to, or a firm decision as to whether they want their name publicly out there um, for everyone to know. And um, I often do this when I uh, work with tribes, I allow them to tell me whether they want their name disclosed or not. It is research and just like we protect individual research participants, I feel like um, part of that is to allow the tribe to determine whether they also want their name out there publicly associated with the study. So uh, again, we haven't made firm, de uh, firm decisions about that. So at this point, I'm not uh, sharing that. So it is a cross-sectional study, a non-probability sample. We are collecting one measurement for each participant and data will be collected over hopefully several months, not too long until we reach um, a sample size of 220. And so, we are hoping to get half attenders, so 110 that are attenders, attended boarding school, and 110 that did not attend boarding schools. So we do have some inclusion and exclusion criteria. So because this is a study based on American Indian boarding schools, and there are uh, non-natives that live on the reservation. We are including only American Indians. Also 18 or older and have the ability to collect a urine, a urine sample because that's how I'm collecting my biomarkers. So we realize that not everyone um, may be able to do this. So it is in inclusion criteria and exclusion criteria are the use of hormones DHE supplements, which is basically a steroid hormone, steroids, adrenal dysfunction, adrenal disorder, adrenal removal, and adrenal cancer. So all of these actually will confound our biomarker readings and permit us to get um, accurate, accurate results. So they are exclusionary criteria. So the outcome variable is allostatic load, um, measure of chronic stress. It's an accumulation of stress that leads to chronic stress. So there is research out there that shows that repeated stress in childhood leads to allostatic load in adulthood. And so basically repeated stress leads to the inability of our bodies to shut off our stress response. And when we're unable to shut off our stress response, it creates 
an overexposure in our systems, creating a dysregulation. And so that dysregulation actually leads to allostatic load. And eventually it can result in the manifestation of chronic diseases. And so there are studies out there that talk about this process. There is no consistent way of measuring allostatic load. And oftentimes it depends on the study population and the topic that you're studying, but um, it can include cardiovascular, metabolic, and immune biomarkers. And so the way that I'm measuring allostatic load or chronic stress in my study is using a combination of biomarkers and then also diagnosed health conditions. So I'm focusing in on excitatory and inhibitory neurotransmitters. And so those will be collected through urine. And then the diagnosed health conditions is basically an inventory of health conditions. So I'm not focusing in on the metabolic markers and I hate to generalize, but American Indians do have a high disease burden. So that might permit us to get accurate readings of people's uh, states, chronic conditions. And um, so I'm not going to collect uh, the metabolic biomarkers. Now, if I had an unlimited amount of money, I could actually collect the biomarkers and also do the health inventory. So given the size of the study, I'm basically focusing on the health inventory for now. So here is a list of the variables. And this is our exposure variable for boarding school attendance. And it's a, just a yes, no answer. But for those people that do answer yes, we are asking a series of questions like age of first attendance, length of time of attendance, and types of experiences. So we have some questions about the experiences that they may have had during boarding schools. So the rest of these here are basically measures um, that were written into the grant. And so some of these are actually COBRE required measures that are measures across all of the COBRE projects. And then some of them are measures that I've included. Um, this group of measures here actually is a result of collaborating with my community partners and them reading the grant and then looking at the measures they felt that we should have more resilience measures. So they um, suggested some, and so we have included those. And then the other thing that they suggested was this parental bonding and attachment measure, which is, I think, just such a fantastic inclusion. And it's actually something that I've thought about in my previous work, where boarding schools has to disrupted that bonding family parental attachment. So they felt that it was really important to include. And so we included it. And then I had parental boarding school attendance and they uh, asked if we could include the grandparents boarding school attendance as well. So we have a generational look at boarding school attendance. So um, this is just a, a little example of some of the things that they've been working on or we've been working on together. Um, let's see. So to talk a little bit about the procedures. So I do have two research assistants that are located here in Grand Forks, uh, Kara Anders Anderson and Jordan Yeager. But eventually, as the study gets going, we will be working with tribal college students who will actually collect the data. And so the flow of the study is basically that tribal college students will recruit. Actually, we hope they don't have to do a whole lot of recruitment. Hopefully, we have good recruitment methods and they can just verify eligibility. So once they verify eligibility, um, they'll schedule a time to come in and complete the informed consent. And once the informed consent is completed, then uh, the, they will provide 
a survey, which is a computer assisted survey. Basically, they get the survey on a tablet and the research assistant will um, load it for them and be there to answer any questions that they have. But the participant actually does the survey um, at their own pace, on their own time, um, at that point in time. So we suspect that the survey is going to take 20 to 45 minutes, and that comes from some of the testing that we've done. So we're guessing maybe about 30 minutes, which is what we initially thought. So once the survey is complete, then the tribal college students, research assistants, will describe the urine collection, they'll show a video, they'll provide instructions, and they'll answer questions, and then set up a time to um, have the participant drop the uh, urine collection off. So we are looking to collect urine samples four times a day, and these are dried urine samples, so it's collected on a strip. They do have the option of dipping the strip in a collection cup or urinating on the strip. So again, four times over a 24 hour period, we're expecting that the entire study for one person will last one to two days. I am, uh, I will be training the tribal college students uh, how to do everything. We'll meet every week and uh, we are providing a respondent compensation for the study. So just to talk a little bit about some of the study changes. So as I mentioned, I had to sort of pivot and move to working with one tribal population. And part of my reasoning for this, as I mentioned, was to create a more homogeneous sample because of the variation in the state. Um, I, the study team now does include the two tribal um, members who are also faculty at the tribal college and tribal college students. So one of the things that I didn't talk about previously is an, a change in the age. And this was also something that I discussed with the tribal partners and they, they said they actually felt like um, boarding school attendance could impact people of all ages. And so that's why they were requesting it to be 18 and older. And in fact, I went into the literature and looked, and there is literature out there that shows that, yes, um, basically anybody who has attended boarding school does have some negative health impacts. So that was changed. And then, like I mentioned, we um, included several new measures, um, the parental bonding. We also included um, some areas in close proximity to the reservation uh, for community members that might live there. So these study changes have been submitted to NIH and uh, we got a verbal approval and I believe I heard Don tell me one time we got approval for the study. <laughs> so, but we are moving forward. We did meet with the project officer and she um, approved it because we're basically changing minor things and the location of the study and not really too much else related to the study. So progress to date. So again, the pivoting to one location did uh, take a little bit of time. Um, it did require some revisions to the study. I, I wanted the, my tribal partners to review the grant, to have input in things that they thought uh, would make it a better project and work on the reservation and also input into just all kinds of other things. So that actually took a lot of uh, time because I wanted to get all of those changes down and then submit them to NIH for approval. And then once that was, uh, once we got the verbal okay to do that, I started working on the IRB approvals for UND and also the tribe. So we have located and incorporated measures into Qualtrics and um, that did take a little bit of time too, because particularly the parental bonding measure 
That is not something I'm at all familiar with. So we actually had many discussions about the measure. We would find some, we would review them. And, and then finally, we found one that is going to work perfect. So uh, that was included. So we have created our Qualtrics survey, and we've tested it. Right now, we're uh, making some minor adjustments to it. And then at that point, we're going to send it to our partners who will review it. And we do actually have some specific things that we want them to look at. And then uh, the other thing that we've been working on for several months is a literature review. And this is in collaboration with one of the research assistants, Jordan Yeager. We've been working on a literature review related to physical health and boarding school attendance. And so, in fact, actually, Jordan presented a poster on it earlier this month at the College of Education and Human Development at their research fair here at UND just at the beginning of the month. So uh, we're now moving towards uh, writing the paper, and hopefully we will have that submitted. So the other thing that we're currently working on is some of the fine details to get the study rolled out. So like contracts and phones and shipping because we wanna ship directly from the tribe to our lab and rental space agreements and respondent compensation. So each of these actually comes with small issues that need to be worked out. So one of the things that isn't on this list that we have done is um, talk about recruitment. Again, we talked with our tribal partners about recruitment. So we definitely have our outlets nailed down and kind of the order that we would use them. Um, we have talked about kind of an overall vision for our recruitment material, but that is something that we are currently working on is recruitment material as well. So I just do want to acknowledge and thank the Tribal College for allowing me to recruit their students to participate in the study and the faculty um, and tribal members who are working with me on this project. I actually feel very blessed to have them as partners. They've um, had such invaluable insight, very supportive and just really wonderful to work with. And then also the research assistants, Jordan Yeager, who's been on the project for about a year now, maybe, yeah, about a year. And then Kara Anderson, who has come on to help us kind of work through some of the fine details and get things up and moving before we move out to collecting data on the reservation. And then I also want to acknowledge my research mentor, Bonnie, who's actually a great support Dr. Bonnie Duran and um, fantastic mentor. And then the funder, of course. And then lastly, I just want to say that all the photos in this presentation were personal photos or photos taken by my family. Great, just an excellent job. And thank you for the update. And it's so important to see uh, the connectivity across generations. And what I really like about the way your protocol has evolved is that it's all based on tribal input, you know, that it's your community partners that are really driving the process. And what a, what a wonderful uh, example, not just of community-based participatory research, but really tribally driven research, so outstanding. Um, not sure if I saw any hands up or questions. Looks like, oh, there was a question from Priscilla. Okay, very good, yeah, Priscilla. Oh. Actually, she just disappeared. <laughs> Oops. I've enabled her mic if she still wants to ask the question. <laughs> yeah, Priscilla, you could unmute and ask your question. Oh, I enabled the wrong Priscilla. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Yes. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Priscilla. I'm here in Rapid City, South Dakota. I'm actually a student in the Master's in Counseling at um, SDSU. And I thought that this presentation was really, really um, um, much needed within some of the work that I do right now. Um, but I wanted just to do some clarification with the work that, that you did, Ursula. 
was, I guess, what was the cohort? Was it individuals that are currently in boarding schools or are these individuals that were, um, ex have experienced boarding schools later um, with their, their history? So the, are, you're talking about the current study right now? Not, yes. Okay, yeah, so this current study is basically anyone 18 or older that has attended boarding schools. Okay. And will this be available to um, individuals here in South Dakota as well? So I am only working with one tribal partner right now. It is a really small study, but if hopefully if things go well, it would be great to do something a little bit uh, more comprehensive across the Northern Plains. So this, these, my understanding of these projects is that they are somewhat pilot projects and that they would lead to larger studies if I, I think if they show promise, <laughs> I think is my understanding. Yes, absolutely. And I have a lot of confidence in all three projects that they'll be fundable at a much higher level to be expanded out to additional communities. So yeah, Priscilla, thank you for the question, because I agree, this is something that we'd love to expand to other communities. So it's really um, kind of uh, more than proof of concept. It's really just showing the, the feasibility of this kind of research uh, being conducted well, but expanding it out beyond there would be great. Thank you so much. All right, and thank you, Dr. Running Bear. Just outstanding progress and appreciate all your hard work and dedication to this. All right, next up, we're very pleased to have our third presenter, uh, Dr. Nicole Redvers. She is a, a member of the Dene Nuque First Nation from Canada. She's a naturopathic physician and also has a Master of Public Health from Dartmouth College and additional doctoral training from uh, Oxford University in uh, evidence-based healthcare. And her study is just outstanding in terms of looking at traditional food. So, uh, Dr. Redvers, I'll hand it over to you. Nasi Cho, thank you. Appreciate the uh, introduction and uh, just uh, um, really happy to, to listen to all of the other presenters and some of the information that's been showcased here today. I think uh, for many of us uh, uh, with backgrounds in Indigenous community work, it's, it's timely that we're starting to finally see focus and attention on some of these important issues that really haven't gotten a lot of focus and attention, at least uh, within biomedicine, but also in greater uh, um, research aspects as it pertains to uh, health effects. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, my project, um, which is uh, utilizing a traditional Indigenous food, which is called chokeberry. And I'll go through a little bit of the background first in terms of the context uh, of uh, traditional foods generally before owning in specifically on uh, the project. Now, it's very uncommon within biomedical spaces specifically to situate ourselves as researchers, um, both uh, from a positionality standpoint, but also from a reflexivity standpoint. And in thinking through an indigenous methodological approach, for us to be accountable to our communities, for us to be accountable to our family, for us to be uh, accountable to the lands that we come from, it's incredibly important to root ourselves in, in where we are and, and who ultimately we can call Salatina or all our relations. So as noted uh, by Dr. Warren, I'm a member of the Dene Nuque First Nation up in Treaty 8 territory in Dene Day or the land of the people, which is part of the Athabascan group that Dr. Warren was talking about this morning, stretching from Alaska all the way down to the Southwest. Uh, my uh, previous background was working as a clinician within a rural and remote area in the subarctic regions of Canada and have uh, recently uh, moved over in the last uh, four or five years doing more Indigenous health scholarship work. And because of that, because of the relationships that exist within Indigenous contexts of, of health, but also uh, of clinical practice, this, this really brings in a responsibility as Indigenous uh, uh, scholars to to ensure that the research questions that are being asked and operationalized are meaningful to community members. And then again, we're accountable to the responsibilities that we have as a part of our uh, relationships and, and reciprocity inherent within our natural or first laws uh, that come from the lands of, of each of our origins. 
Now, I just wanted to, to describe very briefly in terms of this concept of traditional food systems, because we hear this word sometimes in different contexts in various fields, but also in various uh, uh, centers of conversation. And traditional food systems of indigenous people specifically are defined as being composed of items from the local natural environment. But what's uh, really key is that there is that cultural connectivity there, the cultural acceptability uh, as a part of that food. We have a very fine line between what we would consider in the Western uh, words or definition uh, medicine. So food and medicines are essentially looked at uh, very similar, if not the same. Our food is our medicine, uh, just like medicines may be plants uh, on the land or, you know, other elements of the natural environment. Indigenous food preparation very much can be defined broadly, uh, whether or not it comes to the techniques that we utilize, the ingredients that we use, but really sort of arguing that context of, of pre-colonial ingredients, as opposed to, again, I believe it was Dr. Warren talking about fry bread uh, this morning, uh, being you know uh, post-colonial or, or sort of using these invasive species ingredients. Um, and, and really our foods being uh, uh, completely embodied in terms of our identity as Indigenous peoples. And I really like this quote by Jos Jocelyn Ramirez, who stated, decolonizing foodways is a process of connecting to the land, native ingredients, and an ancestral dishes. Now, another topic that's been getting more and more exposure, particularly in the last five years, as it pertains to uh, community rights, but even amplified potentially by some of the changes that we've seen uh, as a result of climate change and, and, uh, and other processes. And I wanted to just broach this because this idea of food sovereignty really comes into the backing for how we think through the, the conceptualization and the development of research questions as it pertains to our foods. And, and food sovereignty really is the right of peoples to healthy and culturally appropriate food produced through ecologically sound and sustainable methods, and their right to define their own food and agricultural systems, really defending the interest and inclusion of, of generations to come, offering strategies really to resist and dismantle the current corporate trade, trade and food regime and directions for food farming, pastoral and fisheries systems, determined of course by local producers and, and users. And, and finally, food sovereignty implies a new social uh, relation free of oppression and inequality between men, uh, women and all peoples, racial groups, social and economic classes and generations. And I always like to show this graph. It's, it, it's somewhat emblematic of uh, the uh, chronic disease graph or figure, I should say, that Dr. Warren noted in the presentation in the morning time, uh, noting, of course, some of the generational impacts uh, from historical trauma to, of course, boarding school, which we've heard uh, a little bit more from Dr. Running Bear's presentation, and then all the way to this um, increasing health dis uh, disparity burden that we see within uh, Indigenous communities. Communities. And as it pertains to food systems, we often, you know, forget to, to consider that piece. Uh, there was mentioned this morning on the, the, the uh, USDA federal food programs before, and then the continuing offerings of some of the um, types of foods that are uh, available within our tribal communities, most of them being in food deserts, for example. And we've really seen this history of uh, rapid degradation, not only from environmental and human caused changes, whether or not it's resource development or, or other types of development, but also loss of land and dislocation. The Trail of Tears was mentioned this morning as one key example of this, really with the, um, the result being a lack of, and a loss of access, in some cases, 100% loss of access to traditional foods, which was a very rapid change in uh, our lifestyle and dietary patterns. You know, societies and communities often had thousands of years to adapt to dietary patterns existing within their unique environments and, and very much um, adapted their metabolic processes to the types of foods that are available. One great example I always like to think about is uh, in my home region, just a little bit more north of me with uh, 
Inuit populations having a traditional diet of uh, over 80% meat products uh, as a part of that, but just an unbelievable um, ability within the genetic expression of genes to uh, uh, host small amounts of calcium, for example, and vitamin C that was, again, a, a necessary adaptation for survival in that type of eating environment. So when we think about a rapid change in lifestyle and dietary, dietary patterns across sometimes one generation or even two generations, there's not a lot of time for our bodies to adapt to those situations. So of course we see disruptions to nutritional imbalances, whether it's micronutrient or macronutrient based, coupled with uh, uh, trauma and psychological stress, which has been uh, well delved into in the prior presentations, platformed on increasing rates of poverty, and then this epidemic of non-communicable chronic diseases and greater susceptibilities to um, even acute diseases as well, which we've seen very clearly throughout the uh, pandemic the last few years. Now, the result, of course, when we see those um, endpoints of chronic disease is that the majority of those diseases are precipitated by or have a component of inflammation. And one thing that I had noticed uh, within clinical practice uh, many years ago through was uh, a lot of my Indigenous uh, patients tended to have higher baseline levels of inflammation on blood testing. And it, it may not necessarily have been completely outside of normal range, but noticeable enough and differential from non-Indigenous patients that it started to raise my eyebrows on what was going on. And after doing some literature study and review, it become very apparent through multiple studies, I've just put a few examples here, that Indigenous peoples have demonstrated higher baseline levels of inflammation currently. And in fact, with that, having a very much higher prevalence of rheumatic conditions and other autoimmune conditions, but also just general itises, whether or not it's iritis or um, colitis or other types of itis inflammation uh, processes. And then, of course, we've heard previously the higher rates of adverse childhood experiences, higher rates of trauma, PTSD, uh, depression, anxiety, and distress. And one thing that I kept thinking about when it came to th this combination of of issues, inflammation, of course, but also some of the, the trauma attributes, unfortunately, due to some of those historical, but also contemporary processes, was that both of these have absolute connections uh, uh, to inflammation. In fact, uh, through adverse childhood experiences, but also uh, many of the mental health conditions today are starting to be investigated for their prime uh, potential stimulator or actual uh, of inflammation. And, and that got me thinking to say, okay, well, wait a sec here. If we have inflammation just generally, but of course we have this platform of historical trauma and contemporary trauma, uh, you know, very clearly demonstrated within the literature. In fact, we've seen this uh, not only within Indigenous populations as a part of research results, but also just generally looking at childhood trauma and relationships to uh, adulthood inflammation. So thinking back to the figure, uh, which was sort of demonstrating all of the trajectory of, of components, whether or not it was land loss, uh, you know, traditional food disruptions to that ultimate, ultimate benchmark of chronic conditions. Uh, part of that, of course, we all know is that poor food diets contribute to inflammation. So here we have these three components, food causing inflammation, uh, you know, traumatic experience creating inflammation that ultimately goes down to the root level. And I very clearly, clearly remember speaking to a traditional healer uh, at some point um, uh, many years ago, who had stated very, very simply, but very eloquently that when we treat patients, when we work with patients traditionally, we, we, we work with them at their core. We work with them deep at their core, so it changes the presentation of, of who they are to, to what they were originally meant to be all along. 
And I thought about that for a long time. And, and what that means, not only symbolically from that medicine wheel perspective that was described by Dr. Warren this morning in terms of you know, mental, emotional, physical, and spiritual components. But then I said, okay, well, how do we knowledge translate that statement into a physical reality? And one thing that was very clear as a part of that process is, is our very root in terms of our existence from the physical elements, of course, is our genetics. And, and the epigenetic uh, sort of field has been booming, really not looking at the genetics that we're, we're, we're born with and can't be, but be changed, but how does the expression of those genes change as we're exposed to various components, whether or not positive or negative in our life? And I thought back to that statement, you know, changing us at our core, how, you know, how does that relate to changing the epigenetic expression, changing the expression of our gene, which has an impact then on all of the subsequent steps that occur afterwards um, in our metabolic function, but also in the development of inflammation. You know, interestingly enough, as noted, there's been a boom within the field of epigenetics, but, but also in the field of nutritional epigenetics and, and thinking through how food and food factors can provide conditioning environments that shape the activity of our genomes, but also the physiology of the body. And we've heard uh, very much within our communities this idea of transgenerational effects of both uh, trauma and also unhealthy eating. The, 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 the potential being, of course, by being exposed to trauma and, and, and unhealthy foods that we're potentially able to pass down those expressive levels of genes to our children and, and to our grandchildren. But then I kept thinking, okay, well, we've always been looking at this from a trauma perspective. What about the positive effects? What about you know, the positive effects of, of foods on inflammation with beneficial metabolic properties. We've seen it demonstrated, for example, in other foods like olive oil and curcumin. Could we actually use foods to change the expression of our genes, epigenetic, going down to that root cause because our elders, our traditional medicine people used foods, they used medicines, they used components as a part of an aid um, of that process of, of gaining wellness. And I kept thinking it by this quote uh, from J.D. Hip that said, if, if you want to destroy a people, you take away the power of their food. But if you want to build a people back up, you build them up through their food. So in come the, the food that is the focus of my project, which is chokeberry. Uh, scientific name is Aronia melanocarpa. And, and this particular food stood out to be specifically, it's, it's a berry that's uh, um, well um, known, particularly around the Great Lakes regions uh, of the United States, but also in Canada. It's a food uh, that was uh, used and is used today uh, as a traditional food. It's also one of the main ingredients in uh, Indigo Baby, which is an indigenous baby food that has been developed out of Minnesota. Um, and why this berry struck my uh, attention was because of the amount of, of research in other contexts outside of Indigenous communities that have been done. And in fact, uh, uh, there's been multiple animal and cell studies done on the effects of chokeberry, everything from antiviral uh, um, actions, neuroprotective, anti-inflammatory, anti-cancer, antioxidant. But also there's been a number of human studies, not in indigenous peoples, but many on its anti-lipidemic, uh, lowering cholesterol, anti-hypertensive or lowering blood pressure, anti-inflammatory, hypoglycemic or blood sugar lowering, and of course, antioxidant. So it's one of those foods that is kind of, I guess what we could call a quiet superfood. One of those foods that seems to have beneficial action across a number of flares, but it is a, a food that's available and, and within some of the contexts uh, of the local region. 
Now, in comparing chokeberry to some of the other foods, it's actually within the top eight. In fact, it's seventh in terms of its ranking of polyphenol content and also within the top 20. And this is of total foods that exist that have been tested on the planet for its antioxidant levels. And the, the only foods that are above those are things like cloves and peppermint. And as you can imagine, uh, I think if you tried to drink clove, you'd, you'd end up having some toxic side effects. So it is an accessible food uh, product that uh, still has extremely high action according to some of these uh, beneficial properties. So with our study specifically, um, we were interested to explore the gene expression changes that are mediated by the consumption of the traditional food chokeberry, specifically in American Indian participants, hypothesizing that the consumption of traditional chokeberry in American Indians will affect epigenetic markers associated with trauma and resiliency. Because remember, those inflammatory um, molecules, those inflammatory mediators are very similar between trauma and resilience as per uh, exposure to unhealthy foods and also some of the backings of the chronic diseases we see today or those itises. And then the second aim being to examine the associations between metabolic uh, endpoints, epigenetics, adverse childhood experiences, and mental health with and without the consumption of chokeberry in our participants. And again, this goes back to the connectivity of our foods, not only affecting our physical well-being, but also our mental, emotional, and spiritual well-being because food is of the land, we are of the land. Those interconnectivities are fundamental as a part of our teachings. So uh, for this study, we're hoping to enroll 50 adult participants, which uh, will involve six weeks of chokeberry juice consumption. The juice is the most easily accessible in terms of consumption um, and doing uh, a primary pre and post gene expression state analysis, uh, really focusing in on the candidate gene IL-6 uh, or interleukin-6, which is a mediator of inflammation within the body, but also looking at other major pro-inflammatory cytokines or, or uh, mediators of inflammation, uh, such as TNF-alpha and IL-1 uh, beta, given their relation to trauma. So again, in an autoimmune patient that has uh, rheumatoid arthritis or other types of uh, autoimmune immune conditions, you'll often see these levels elevated, but you will also see them elevated in relation to trauma. So the connecting piece and how food can actually impact those. Um, thanks to our uh, wonderful partners at the USDA Grand Forks Nutrition Lab in, uh, with it within the town, and, and I'll go through some of our partners a little bit later. Uh, some preliminary studies led by Dr. Uh, Kate uh, uh, Claycomb Larson uh, had thankfully, and I was holding my breath a little bit on this one, uh, demonstrated, at least on the cell level, some of the uh, uh, IL-6 uh, expression changes that were induced by a chokeberry extract. So this was kind of a little bit of a, a hooray on my end to demonstrate that yes, this thinking was along the right lines. There does appear to be some uh, gene expression change that occurs uh, in this case in human pre sites. But we wanted to of course ensure and, and demonstrate that this uh, may be the case also within human participants. There's a number of secondary uh, blood parameters as well as urine uh, metabolites that we were interested in looking in, including of course interleukin-6 just within the blood level, not necessarily only the, the expression level on the genetic level, uh, C-reactive protein, which is again another generalized marker of inflammation, lipid panel fasting glucose, of course, given the uh, human uh, participant studies that have been done uh, previously outside of indigenous communities, and then urinary hydroxydeoxy Guyanese, say that one 10 times, uh, which is a urinary marker of antioxidant. In fact, it measures DNA breakdown within uh, the body. And then blood pressure plus our, our survey tools. I think many of these surveys, survey tools have been reviewed by the, the previous projects, so I, I won't go into them at this time. 
And I just wanted to note that um, one of the challenges when it comes to randomized placebo controlled studies, specifically within Indigenous participants and traditional foods, is you can imagine the difficulty in trying to create a control of a traditional food that's been consumed within a community. Because I guarantee you, if I tried to give, um, you know, one of my elders a traditional food product, um, and then tried to give an equivalent food product, you know, with maybe similar color, taste parameters, guarantee that elder is going to know that, that that's not the, the food that is, uh, um, um, you know, what was being assessed for. So, so it becomes very difficult to think through these types of studies uh, in that regard. But also there's this element of tricking that comes into control. And, and when you're utilizing food products that could also be considered medicines, that there's some cultural difficulties, you know, and challenges that really need to be worked through with communities in this regard. So because this is a, a somewhat of a pilot uh, study, we decided to use self as own control as opposed to having a, a control group and similar uh, challenges and, and considerations as Dr. Williams' presentation is ensuring that for sample collection and storage, even of blood materials, um, that we gave the option to participants or giving the option of participants to actually take um, their vials back if they're uh, not wanting to uh, or want to have a verification that their samples won't be used for other purposes outside of this study. I do want to note, uh, similar to Dr. Williams, of course, that this study was uh, conceptualized prior to the pandemic. And one of the, the key challenges within a panic, pandemic environment outside, of course, you know, recruitment um, um, considerations is that uh, both infection, whether it's flu, cold, or otherwise, but also vaccination actually induces temporary inflammation within the body. So when your main marker of a study is inflammation, there could be challenges in terms of making sure that there's not an interference with either recent vaccina vaccination or an acute infection as a part of that, that process. Uh, so we've had some delays in terms of pandemic, just like the other uh, two projects. However, we're getting close and, and hopefully going to be starting recruitment very soon. Just want a, a call out uh, to our local partners and mentors. I noted the USDA Grand Forks Human Nutrition Research Center and my mentors, Dr. Kate Clayco Larson and Dr. James Romich, which has both just been fundamentally helpful as a part of this project. And we've recently brought on El True Health System to uh, support our blood draws with our participants. Um, I just want to highlight some of our local community members, and in particular, Hilary Kempenich, for developing this beautiful graphic that we're able to use as part of our recruitment uh, material. I think it's really important for us to embody our own narratives and showcase our strengths as part of the research that we do. And finally, in, in considering you know, this element of, of decolonizing or bringing us back to our food ways, I really let, love this quote decolonizing our diets means that we are trying to reconnect with healthier ways to nourish ourselves. This means connecting to our ancestral knowledge, knowledge that has been passed down for thousands of years in the Americas. So with that, I want to say Masi Cho, uh, thanks for the opportunity to share some of the work so far and look forward to the coming discussions and also seeing some of the outputs, uh, not only within this project, but hopefully inspiring others to consider our traditional foods and, and how they impact our health uh, uh, and well-being. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Redvers. Looks like we have a question from Patricia Nez Henderson. Patricia, great to see you here. Hi, good afternoon. Yeah, A, can you hear me okay? Yep. Hi, that was a wonderful presentation. I'm calling in from Rapid City this afternoon, so I apologize for the traffic noise. <laughs> um, with our efforts with Navajo Nation, one of the things that we're doing um, in, in terms of educating our communities about the role of ceremonial versus commercial tobacco products is that we're going back to our teachings and letting, letting our communities know that tobacco is actually one of our four sacred, one of the four sacred foods for the Navajo people. So there's corn, squash, beans, and tobacco. And for, for us to rehear, you know, for us to hear that again, I think it really speaks to the importance of healing in, in using tobacco. And um, so we continue to do that. Um, 
I'd be really curious to know if other tribes have that in terms of their food structures. Um, I think with our efforts, again, we're just really decolonizing tobacco and really reclaiming um, a product that is very sacred to us. So it's just the message for, I guess, for all of us to continue. But great work. That, that's wonderful work that you're doing out there. Thank you. And Don, great job, brother. Thank you for bringing this out, out to all of us today. Wonderful. Masi Cho, thanks. And you're absolutely right. It's great to see the, the resurgence, you know, of, of all of our practices and, and, and foods and medicines as we see them, because they really are the strength and root of communities. And so much is built from those original instructions and teachings, but also really thinking through how we, we knowledge translate that into a modern world where young people, you know, are, are interested in some of these things in, in maybe more Western ways. Ways and, and perhaps that's a bridging point to connect these conversations. Yeah, and what a wonderful way to, to bridge traditional food and uh, traditional agricultural knowledge and modern science. It's just really exciting research. All right, uh, Kathy, looks like you have your hand up as well. Hi, I really enjoyed this. I've been enjoying the whole conference. It's been amazing. Um, so I am also doing a little networking for my mentee. She couldn't attend today, and um, I would love to, love for her to meet you. She actually won, it's called the uh, Big Ideas um, Competition at the Student Global Leadership Conference. It was hosted by the uh, Royal Geological Society in London, and uh, she's a mentee of mine through the American Indian Science and Engineering Society, and I think this would be excellent. She looked at the concept of, of placing um, free tiny you know, food pantries within the community and having people contribute. And I think that it would be wonderful to include the element of true indigenous foods to help, you know, along with the healthy versions of what's going on to help improve people's general physical and spiritual health. I, I would love for her to meet you. So yeah, I just wanted to say that her name's Joanna and I will, she couldn't come today to the uh, conference. And so I will actually pass this on. And when you put your information up, my name's Kathy McAlpine and I will do an introduction for you. You know, we, we all have to have the babies following us, right? Mm -hmm. Sorry. Absolutely. Thanks, Kathy. Appreciate it. And yeah, absolutely. Anytime, feel free to connect. Um, I, I think maybe we can, maybe I'll Put my email in the chat and, and feel free to have her reach out more than happy to connect with our our relatives yeah that's a good idea thank you uh dr redvers and and for all the attendees this is being recorded and will be available on our website so if you have other colleagues who might uh, benefit from the discussion uh they'll be able to watch the recorded version of it and uh, just uh, thank you so much for the questions and, and comments and uh, Patricia, uh, Dr. Henderson, Nez Henderson, so wonderful to see you. We actually met in medical school nearly maybe 30 years ago. It's hard to believe, but just so wonderful to see you here. Thank you. All right. Well, I think that's all the questions that we have um, for Dr. Redvers. Next up, uh, we're just so pleased to have uh, our good friend Mandy Fretz here. Dr. Fretz is Micmac, and she has both a PhD and MPH in epidemiology from the University of Washington. And she's done a lot of work, uh, particularly around cardiovascular health research. And she's closely connected to the Strong Heart Study. So it'd be wonderful to get an update in terms of Strong Heart Study, but also some uh, exciting research opportunities linked to that work. So uh, Mandy, welcome, and I'll hand it off to you. Thank you so much. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see it. Do you see the big slide or do you see the, um, the, this little slide with the presentation view? No, it's a big slide. It's in presentation mode, yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Well, thank you so much. I'm, I'm very happy to be here today and apologize for my voice. We have a, my son has croup and I think um, I have some remnants of it, of, of what that looks like in an adult. Um, but I'm happy to be here today and, and share some findings about uh, the Strong Heart Study. And the title of my presentation is Better Understanding Diet, Physical Activity, and Cardiometabolic Health in American Indians. So I have my presentation broken up into different components. So first I'm gonna give you a bit of background about myself. 
And then I'll talk a little bit about the rationale for the, the Strong Heart study. I'll give you an overview of the study for those of you who might not be familiar with it, as well as go over some key findings. And then, and then I'm gonna talk very, very briefly about an ongoing intervention that we have in the Cheyenne River community, which is, is one of the Strong Heart communities that I'm leading. Um, so before we get started, just a, a bit of background about myself. I'm Mi'kmaq and I'm a member of Eel Ground First Nation. And for those of you not familiar with Canada, Eel Ground is in New Brunswick, um, which is on the east coast of Canada, right near the Mirishi River. <clears throat> and although most of my family still lives on the reserve, I've been in, in Seattle for the past 16 years. I came here originally for graduate school. Um, I was a graduate uh, student for six years. I did my, my master's, my MPH, as well as my PhD in epidemiology here at, at the University of Washington. And then I spent three years here as a postdoc, and I've been on the faculty now for, for seven years. Um, I was a first-generation college student, and I've really always been interested in, in public health and the prevention of, of diabetes and, and the prevention of heart disease. Um, and this is because as a child, I experienced firsthand the impact of, of these diseases on, on my community and on my family. And my grandmother, my dad, um, several of my aunts and uncles and cousins have experienced uncontrolled diabetes and, and related complications due to that. And my dad passed away from heart complications due to diabetes at the very young age of, of 58, just a, a couple of years ago. So, um, you know, this work is, is very near and, and dear to me. So as way of background, the, the burden of, of cardiovascular disease and, and diabetes and, and related chronic diseases differentially affects subsegments of the population. Um, and cardiovascular disease and diabetes in particular are leading causes of mor morbidity and mortality in American Indians. And the, the prevalence of diabetes in the strong heart study participants um, at the baseline exam, which was done a long time ago in, in 1989, was about 45%, um, and that's compared to about 7.7% in the general population, so, so a very high burden of disease. Um, and, and unfortunately, this burden is not limited to, to middle-aged or, or older folks, and among American Indians who are less than 35 years of age who received healthcare at IHS, the age-adjusted prevalence of, of clinician-diagnosed diabetes increased from 8.5 to 17.1 per 1,000 population between 1994 and 2004. So that's that's a 50% increase over, over 10 years. Um, and it's unclear if, if this di diagnosed diabetes is, is due to an increase in, in the incidence of diabetes, um, an increase in screening for diabetes, or a combination of, of both. Uh, the magnitude of this prevalence is, is very striking. And it's been hypothesized that this increase in diabetes in American Indian communities is attributable at least in part to recent changes in lifestyle. Um, the adoption of sedentary lifestyles and, and largely Western diets, including the increased consumption of, of, of processed foods, that's happened over many years, um, starting with the, with the forced migration onto reservations, has drastically changed, changed lifestyle um, in, in, in the population. And this may be um, largely explaining the, the burden of, of, of disease that we see today. So most of what we know about cardiometabolic diseases in American Indians comes from the Strong Heart Study. Um, and this is a longitudinal study of, of heart disease and diabetes, and it's supported by the um, NHLBI and the Indian Health Services. Um, and it's, it's really the longest ongoing study. It's been ongoing since 1988. And there's 12 participating tribes from four states, from Arizona, Oklahoma, North Dakota, and, and South Dakota. And the study was, was started in, in 1988 because at that time, little was known about heart disease in American Indian communities. And without any sort of factual evidence at the time, it was believed that the, the prevalence of heart disease was actually lower in American Indians relative to other population groups. So, so the Strong Heart Study was started to measure rates of heart disease and, and measure risk factors for heart disease in these 12 communities. Um, and it's because of the strong heart study that we now know that heart disease and, and related conditions like diabetes have a much higher prevalence in American Indians <clears throat> relative to other population groups. So the, the strong heart study is actually really broken up into, into two cohorts. Um, the original study compri comprised about 4,500 
um, uh, middle-aged or older folks, about 59% of the, the cohort was female, and they had three examinations over a 10-year period, um, starting in, in 1989 and going through 1999. Um, and those exams were, were pretty comprehensive. They included a, a personal interview, a, a physical exam, a laboratory workup, as well as a physical activity assessment. And, in, um, and we're actually planning right now for, for the next exam. We've had ongoing surveillance since 1999, but, but no, no further exams in, in this um, segment of the, of the study. Um, but we're currently planning for another exam that will hopefully commence this summer um, and hopefully in August. Um, but you know, this was the original study. And then in, in 2001, the study was reshaped to focus on genetic risk factors for cardiovascular diseases. Um, and this was because, it, you know, uh, a lot of folks, a, a lot of researchers, um, the community members were seeing clustering of, of disease within families. So the goal of the, of the Strong Heart Family Study was to map and identify genes that contribute to risk of heart disease in American Indians. So for this part of the study, only large families were able to participate. So the mean age of, uh, uh, the mean number of families who participated um, was there was 96 families with about 19 members per family. So these were very large families of, of great grandmas, grandmas, um, you know, parents, children, uh, grandchildren. So very large extended families. Um, and similar to the original cohort, about 60% of the cohort was female. Uh, they had two exams over uh, an eight year period. So they had their first exam in 2001, and then they had a follow-up exam starting in 2007. And uh, similar to the, the original cohort, um, we're bringing, we're hoping to bring in the, um, the Strong Heart Family Study participants again this summer for, for a follow-up exam. And this is just, you know, it's, it's a pretty complicated study. So this is just giving you a, a timeline. Um, so again, the original study started way back in, in the 80s, um, and that was the middle-aged or older folks. Um, and they, they continued to be followed through surveillance, um, but they had three exams between 1989 and 1999. Um, you know, in, in 2001, um, we started the family study um, and they have had two exams. And again, they continue to be followed for, by surveillance and we're bringing um, everyone back in again, um, this starting this summer. And, you know, there's been very little attrition in, in the strong heart study aside from, aside from deaths. Um, so follow-up is, is greater than, than 90%. So all of the, the, these study exams have been extremely detailed. Um, there's been a lot of variables collecting, including things like demographic factors, um, bioelectrical impedance, and that's a way to measure body fat and, and muscle mass, uh, blood pressure, um, pedal pulses, and ankle brachial, brachial blood pressure, um, DNA, and that's really to look for clustering and, and, and genes that may be a family clustering of diseases and genes that may be associated with certain risk factors or outcomes. Um, there's also been lots of biomarker data collected, um, everything from lipids and chemistries to um, hemoglobin A1C to measure diabetes control, um, measures of inflammation like fibrinogen and, and CRP, um, as well as uh, markers of kidney function, including urinary creatinine and albumin, um, and also many more. Um, of participants have also had ECGs, um, cardiac and, um, and ultrasounds as part of each exam. Uh, you know, there's also other categories of phenotypes. I don't have a lot of time to go into all the details, but um, there are assessments of pulmonary function, um, family history of, of diseases, uh, reproductive history. Um, at the family study, we collected uh, dietary data um, with food frequency questionnaires. Um, and at the, in the original study, we used uh, dietary recalls. Uh, physical activity has been collected with both questionnaires as well as pedometers. Um, more recently, um, we've collected, um, using stored samples, uh, we've collected some data on environmental toxins since um, there's been a lot of concern in some communities about arsenic in, in the soil um, and other heavy metals like lead and, and cadmium. Um, there's also several cultural questionnaires um, as well as questionnaires on social and mental health, including depression, locus of control, as well as social support. Another big part of the Strong Heart Study is to respond to community needs and, and meet people where they're at. So, you know, the study was designed to study diabetes and to study heart disease, 
Um, but the last couple of years have been, as we all know, have been very challenging um, due to COVID-19. Um, so we've really shifted to working on um, COVID-19. Um, so this includes collecting data around the impact of COVID-19 on the health and well-being, um, which uh, we've been doing by phone, um, and additionally, community outreach. Um, so Missouri Breaks, which is the, the field center for Strong Heart Study, which is located in, in Eagle Butte, uh, received a grant from, from John Hopkins to allow for the distribution of vouchers for food and personal care supplies to community members who needed assistance um, throughout the pandemic. Um, the vouchers were be able to be redeemed at local stores, um, and they were handed out with a face mask by local community members, as well as a, as a bottle of hand sanitizer with the Strong Heart Study um, logo. And at the beginning of the pandemic, a lot of uh, a lot of the work was really around working with tribal health on education around hand washing, social distancing, and working with local grocery stores and businesses to get um, protocols in place to protect. Um, not only workers, but also folks who are visiting the stores um, from, from COVID. Um, Missouri Breaks was also able to distribute more than 500 radios to elders in the community who might not otherwise have access to re reliable sources of news about the pandemic um, because they might not have a TV or internet. Um, and the radios were distributed in all three uh, Strongheart communities in, in North Dakota and in South Dakota. Uh, the Strong Heart Study is also participating in a bigger consortium um, to make sure that uh, American Indians are represented in, in national data around COVID-19. Um, and the biggest study that um, Strong Heart is participating in is a study called uh, the Collaborative Cohort of Cohorts for COVID-19 Research. Um, and this is being led by um, Dr. Lizzie Olsner, who's uh, in New York City. She's at Columbia University. And it's designed to better understand the impact of COVID-19 on communities throughout the US. Um, and there's a lot of studies participating in this, um, this effort, um, not just Strong Heart Study, but um, large cohort studies like MESA, um, Framingham, Soul Study. Um, and essentially it's, it's being done by phone and, and by mail. So it's a series of questionnaires as well as a dried blood spot collection. Um, that's looking for antibodies to, to, uh, to uh, the COVID-19. Um, and what's, I think, a strength of this is that, you know, it's, it's really allowed for the capture of a full range of COVID-19 clinical severity, um, anything from asymptomatic. So, you know, if, if, you know, they have antibodies before they had the vaccine, then we know that they, they were infected at some point, but they may not have had symptoms. Um, anything from, you know, the asymptomatic as well as to the critically ill. Um, and, you know, I feel like a lot of the research on COVID-19 right now is focused on hospitalizations and, and, and folks who have been in the hospital, but C4R is really capturing that whole range um, of, you know, from asymptomatic to, to critically ill. So it's reducing um, biases um, since it's using this, this cohort design of the general U.S. population. Um, and uh, so this is just a map here, and this is showing all the participants in this, uh, the, the C4R the C4R COVID project, um, and more than half of participants self-identify as, uh, as BIPOC. And this is just a snapshot of what we've learned in the past year. Um, it hasn't been published yet. It's, um, it, it's currently under review. Um, but uh, this table has the name of each of the studies that is participating, the percent of study participants who self-reported COVID infection, um, and that's in, as well as test positivity and who were hospitalized. Um, and as you can see in the, the participating strong heart studies um, communities, um, there was a lot more infection. So 28% um, of study participants have self-reported a, a COVID infection. Um, uh, you know, there's 22.1% test positivity and um, there's also more hospitalizations and more deaths in strong heart study communities um, when compared to the other cohorts. So that just describes some of the basics of Strong Heart Study in general um, and some of the work that's been ongoing recently. And now I'll talk a little bit about some key findings. Um, so the 10,000 foot view here is that rates of heart disease um, in American Indians and Strong Heart is higher than other US populations. Um, there are also very high rates of insulin resistance and, and diabetes. Um, and uh, diabetes is a major risk factor for heart disease. And we know that the metabolic aging starts in the young. 
Um, so young adults um, have evidence of abnormalities of heart function that's detectable many years before the onset of diagnosed heart disease. So most of my work in the Strong Heart Study has really focused on modifiable risk factors for diabetes and for heart disease, since I'm really interested in prevention. Um, so, so I'll just give you a couple of slides on some of the work that I've been doing. Um, so to assess diet in the Strong Heart Study, or the Strong Heart Family Study, we used a food frequency questionnaire. Um, and this was an interview administered questionnaire. It's, um, it's, it's, it's a questionnaire that we, um, that we asked participants about 119 food items that they consumed over the past year um, on a typical day. Um, and additionally, um, we had an American Indians food supplement that represents some of the foods that are commonly consumed in some of the participating communities, but that are not on the general food questionnaire. And the reason that we combined both the, a food frequency questionnaire as well as an American Indian food supplemental questionnaire is that it's been shown that in some communities, the inclusion of ethnic foods can contribute substantially to daily nutrient and caloric intake. Um, so we felt that it was important to include um, foods that are consumed um, typically, um, and this includes um, um, some foods like buffalo, which is actually now a part of, of the commodity program, um, as well as some other types of foods. Um, so in order for participants to accurately report, to recall uh, the, the dietary intake, uh, we used some visual aids. So we had pictures and um, in um, three, dimension, three dimensional figures for, for portion size. So essentially, participants would report which foods they're consuming, um, as well as the how often and in the portion size. And we, would, we, would, we took that and we were able to multiply um, the portion size by the nutrient content of the food um, and, and by the documented um, amount that they were consuming. And then we sum them for all foods. And this was able, this was, gave us the ability to, to have a, a pretty good idea of total caloric intake as well as um, you know, number of servings of fruits and vegetables per day. And, as well as, as, um, as well as other types of nutrients. Um, so this is just giving you a snapshot of, of some of our findings. So in the, in the family study, the average age was 34 years, about 60% were female. Um, so these folks were asked to wear pedometers for a week. So, you know, one of the metrics that people use to define a, a, an active person from an unactive person is 10,000 steps per day. There's nothing magical about 10,000 steps. You know, we've done work in Strong Heart that's shown that taking as, as few as 3,500 steps per day is actually associated with some health, health benefit. Um, but 10,000 steps per day has been pretty consistently used in the literature and other populations to, um, to classify folks who are active from folks who are less active. So based on that metric, about 12% of folks um, consume 10,000 steps per day. Um, no one achieved four or more of the American Heart Association dietary goals. About 17% had um, normal body weight, so that's BMI of less than 25. 56% um, were never smokers or who had quit more than a year ago. 70% had uh, normal cholesterol. 39% um, had normal blood pressure. And 57% had normal glucose. Um, and this is showing the dietary um, achievement of the dietary goals. So the American Heart Association has these Life Simple 7 goals that are intended to reduce the burden of heart disease. Um, first, it was by 2020 and now it's by 2025. Um, so, um, and these are the foods that's included. Um, so we have consuming at least four and a half cups a day of fruits and vegetables, consuming two or more servings of fish per week, consuming three or more servings of whole grains per day, consuming less than 1,500 milligrams of sodium per day, consuming less than 36 ounces of sugar-sweetened beverages, things like pop um, per day, consuming two or few servings of processed meat per week, consuming less than 7% of calories from saturated fat, and consuming four or more servings of nuts, legumes, and seeds per day. Um, so here we have um, the, the achievement in the Strong Heart Family Study shown in yellow, and then the achievement in the NHANE study, which is just uh, our representation of the general U.S. population in, in red. Um, so as you can see, most Americans, um, whether they're in strong heart study or not, are, are, are not meeting these guidelines. Um, but in general, there's fewer strong heart family study participants meeting the guidelines than NHANES participants. And that's except for the nuts, seeds, and legumes um, guideline, which in the strong heart study was driven by pretty high intakes of, of peanut butter in, in the population. 
So, you know, I feel like based, um, you know, the take home message is that, you know, there's a need for widespread improvements in diet, physical activity and obesity prevention among American Indians. Um, and uh, I feel like, you know, over the past 20 years, the, the Strong Heart Study has done a, a really good job in giving us a good sense of the risk factors for heart disease. Um, and, uh, you know, based on these findings from this observational study, I feel like we really need to implement um, uh, interventions, implement qualitative research to really understand uh, barriers and facilitators to physical activity, to diet, and to other factors that influence cardiometabolic health. Um, and uh, we, we started to do this um, in, in one of the Strong Heart Study communities, um, and, I'll, and uh, we had a, a pilot study, um, which we completed, that was was um, designed to, to identify the major barriers and facilitators to eating healthy. So we had several focus groups. We met with several tribal leaders in the community, and, and this was just in, in Cheyenne River. Um, and based on that, we were able to, to work with uh, the adult diabetes program to develop um, an intervention. Um, and uh, yeah, so the intervention is currently ongoing. Um, so it, it's a partnership of, of UW, Missouri Breaks, and the Cheyenne River Adult Diabetes Program, um, where we're working together um, to promote healthy eating and optimal diabetes management for community members with type 2 diabetes. Um, and again, this was based on pretty extensive pilot work um, to help us understand what the major barriers were as identified by the community members, as well as identified by um, local dietitians and the head of the WIC program, the head of the Kamads program. Um, and, uh, the, and we also did a market basket assessment um, to see what foods are available locally, um, since you know, access to, to healthy food is, is, is a major barrier for, for many community members. That came up in, in the focus groups um, and we were able to do this USDA market basket assessment to actually see what types of foods are available. Um, because if you can't have an intervention if, if you don't really understand the types of foods that are available in the community. Um, so the aims of our, our Cheyenne River Cooking for Health study are to um, conduct a randomized trial to determine if a culturally tailored healthy food budgeting, purchasing, and cooking intervention influence diet and um, diet cardiometabolic health among American Indians. Um, it's ongoing right now, so our goal is to enroll 165 people. We're currently at 135, um, so, so we're getting close. And our outcomes are really to look at differences in diet and food budgeting at throughout a year, so at month zero, six and 12 months, as well as to look at differences in diabetes control and BMI at zero, six and 12 months. Um, and uh, we also hope to conduct a mixed methods process evaluation to assess intervention reach, fidelity, satisfaction, and effectiveness. Um, and this is important because if this is effective, we'd really like to um, kind of roll this into the standard adult diabetes programming. Um, so we really wanna get a sense from the community members about what's working from in this program and, and what's not working. Uh, so this started uh, two weeks before COVID. Um, so the timing was not ideal. Um, so we actually ended up having to, to adapt this intervention a little bit. So currently the curriculum is, is tablet-based. So when folks come in, so, so folks will come in, will be randomized to receive the intervention right now or a year from now. Um, and if they're randomized to receive the intervention right, right now, um, we give them a tablet. Um, and on this tablet, there's um, cooking videos, some lessons on budgeting and, and grocery store shopping that are led by an elder in the, elder in the community. Um, we're calling participants every month to check-ins to make sure that they're, they're engaging with the tablet, like watching the videos. We had broken it down by month so that it's, it's not too much of a burden for, for, for folks. Um, and then at this exam, when they're given uh, the, the tablet, they're also given tools to help prepare healthy meals. So what had come up in some of our preliminary work was that a lot of people don't necessarily have access to bowls, to knives, to measuring spoons um, to, to really help with cooking. So um, we're providing a lot of supplies um, as well as a lot of incentives. So we have monthly raffles um, to really um, to really incentivize people to, to watch the, 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 the videos on the tablet, to try the recipes. Um, we all, we, we also, we're also offering, um, we're partnering with the grocery store to offer um, uh, vouchers for, for food. Um, so this is really a work in progress. It looks a lot different now um, that we've kind of adapted a bit because of COVID, um, you know, uh, but uh, we're, we're calling people, we're having these raffles. So it, it seems to be working well. 
Um, we hope to finish enrolling in the next six months um, and, uh, and, and we'll keep you posted about uh, what our findings are. Um, so if you want to read a little bit more about the studies, um, we have a, a couple of papers published and, and one was about um, the, the qualitative work that informed it. Um, and, and another one was about the, the market basket assessment that was done at all of the, the grocery stores, the convenience stores and the dollar stores on, on, on Cheyenne River. Um, so yeah, so as I mentioned, we already we have 135 people enrolled. Um, and uh, we're collecting data on a lot of different, um, a lot of different variables. Um, so we started with a, a pretty basic, a basic study, and then when the, the pandemic started, we added a little bit more to it. So originally, we were just collecting data on social demographics, housing, sleep, medical history, um, medical history, um, traditional values and culture, social support, um, and then healthy food preparation, dietary choices, cooking barriers, healthy food self-efficacy food security, um, it, it, we're giving a physical activity questionnaire, um, but we also now have included um, how uh, more detailed measures on food security and different changes in the food environment and how people are changing how they interact with the food environment due to COVID-19. I know a lot of people, especially early on in the pandemic, um, didn't go to the stores as regularly. Um, they were really trying to minimize exposure, so that may play a role on, on what we find, but we are collecting data on that as well. Um, so again, Strong Heart Study, Cooking for Health, C4R, they're, they're all about community um, academic partnerships. Um, so I just listed some of our, our, of our key collaborators. And there's a lot of opportunities for student involvement um, within all of these projects. Um, so if, uh, if, if, if you have a student or if you're an investigator and you're interested in, in some sort of analyses, um, there's really, especially with Strong Heart, we have data going back to the 80s and it, it's very rich and there's lots of opportunities to write papers. Um, so I encourage you to, to go to the website and, and see the types of questionnaires that we have. Um, C4R also has a website and um, they have a lot of information available online. That study just started recently, so, so the, the website is not as mature. Um, but also, if you have any questions um, or you want to get involved, please feel free uh, to reach out to me. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Mandy. Really appreciate that. And uh, Dr. Fretz has been a great uh, partner and, and is willing to work with our PhD students in Indigenous Health as well to look at some data analysis. Um, looks like we do have a hand up from Kathy McAlpine. So feel free to ask your question. Hi, uh, thank you for, for doing your study. I um, actually in 2017 won a uh, CDC and American College of uh, Preventive Medicine grant uh, for diabetes prevention and uh, for prediabetes. I was covering a practice that had uh, a lot of the patients were above the 60% were above the age of 60 and you know one in three just people in the population have prediabetes and one in two above the age of 65. And I uh, passed the study on to uh, the older adult wellness uh, center that we used to have. Unfortunately, it disappeared, but we had uh, amazing results. It, it, it involved um, the combination of nutrition, you know, changes in nutritional intake, exercise. So I actually recruited a nutritionist for part of it and also physical therapy to actually promote exercise with the individuals. And we followed their hemoglobin A1C uh, and BMI and things like that. Uh, it was fascinating. It was it was just for that little bit of intervention. You know, it, it was a year long program, and mm -hmm. it was more of an actual intervention program. So, if, if I can be of any help, please let me know. It was a, more of an intervention than actually a study. I looked at the data though to see that it was effective, and it, it truly was. And I wanted to say to you, my grandmother is a, a famous uh, New Brunswicker. Or however, you say that. Oh, really? New yes. Brunswick. And, um, and it, her, her name's Mary Matilda Winslow. And we just found out uh, she was the first woman of color to graduate uh, University of New Brunswick, graduated top in the university in 1905. Oh my and gosh. When we were, they're actually doing a, uh, I just got an email two weeks ago. They're doing a, a musical that includes, you know, they're trying to get members of our family to participate. And what happened when we did, we knew a lot of the rest of our family were, you know, uh, Native American um, ancestry. We didn't realize that subset. And it turns out they have her listed there as First Nation also. 
she's black and first nation but you can look her up mary matilda winslow they had you know Fred, uh, the university the town of fredericton has a uh, you know uh, museum exhibits and stuff but oh i'm gonna goodness. i'm gonna track you down to find out about my other ancestry <laughs> okay. yeah definitely yeah, that's that's amazing. Yeah, there's not too many folks who I, especially well in Seattle, who are Micmac, where who even know where New Brunswick is. Um, so well, no, I mean, and I literally have been communicating with them several times over the last uh, couple of weeks. So that was just crazy. And I would love to share with you uh, the older adult wellness. I had them implement the study, and um, you know, there were even in the first eight weeks, people were losing weight. They were, you know, significant amounts and just I think part of being part of a, a support group and mm -hmm. and then I would periodically go and tell them I play hockey I'm not a baby anymore but uh, but I still you know up until COVID play hockey so I go and tell them you know you're this you're the the special people that were taken for this study so you better do the right thing and don't mess with me because I play hockey so we had great results <laughs> <laughs> you know? That's great. That's great to hear. Yeah, I hope our, our our program is just as successful as yours. And I'll reach out to you. Yeah, we. I mean, we're still collecting data, but we have had some people come in for their six months visit, and they seem very happy. You know, they 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 feel like healthier. Some of them have lowered their diabetes medications, and their BMI is down. So, you know, I think the focus and what had coming up in our focus groups is that you know just the cooking skills have not been passed down from generation to generation in a, in a lot of families. So, you know, a lot of our curriculum was really focusing on, um, you know, uh, local recipes and, and kind of empowering people to, to, you know, make traditional foods. And um, so, so I feel like, uh, I feel like so far we've gotten positive feedback. We, we don't know what the results are yet since it's ongoing. You know, I think, I think though, just, just to give you a virtual hug, I mean, I think that we all do better uh, as, as a friend that I, we sit and text each other, well, have you written this out yet? Have you done this? Have you exercised? Have you done, you know, whatever? And we call it accountability. And the more that you're accountable to someone else, it sort of gives you that extra edge. So yeah, I mean, no, good luck with sense. it. I'm Thank gonna put you. My, I'm gonna put my email in the chat and please reach out if I can. Oh no, my chat's disabled, it says. So uh, I will get your information and... Um, okay you know, and then we will, we, I've been, I think, let me see if I, I look like I could put mine in the chat. So let me see if I can do that right now. Do you see it? Not yet. Let's see. It looks like it is in the chat. Oh. Yeah. You, you know but, what might have happened? Oh, oh, is, oh, oh I think it's, it has to go, it's going on the whole. So let me see if I could do it. Look, I just put everyone in. Let's see if that makes it better. That is crazy, though. I, I seriously, I almost never meet anybody from New Brunswick. No, I met, I've met, you know, since I've been in right? Seattle for 16 years, I met one Micmac, you know, in, in you know, and there's a pretty big First Nations uh, contingency in, in Seattle, um, but very few people from the East Coast of Canada. No, no. So anyway, hello, cousin. All right. <laughs> Great. And just ironically, the uh, program official at NIH is Dr. Sheila Caldwell, who is also of Micmac. Uh, oh, from, really? Yeah, First Nations from Canada. Yeah, there's not a lot of program officials at NIH who are Indigenous, but uh, our uh, PO is uh, for this particular research project. All right, if there's any other questions, please feel free to put those in the chat. And, uh, and again, uh, Dr. Fretz, thank you so much for the presentation. We look forward to continued collaboration. I think there's a lot of areas where we can work together with our Indigenous Health Programming here at UND and with the National Database uh, through Strong Heart Study. So thank you so much. Absolutely, thank you so much for the opportunity to present. Great. Well, I uh, don't plan to go the full hour for wrap up, but I did want to just uh, address a couple of other key points and would love to get input from any of the participants in terms of their ideas on next steps. So again, this is the Indigenous Trauma and Resilience Research Center. And uh, our first three projects you've heard about, so that's Drs. Williams, Running Bear, and Redbers, but we also have a pilot project funding mechanism. And then once our wave of the first three um, researchers get their own R01 research grants to pursue their research on a broader scale, then we'll be able to fund additional researchers, uh, additional uh, uh, early career faculty here at UND to pursue uh, research that's going to address the impact of trauma and resilience. And uh, this is data that I'd mentioned, but I wanted to show it graphically. 
this is the decade prior to the pandemic, and we're finalizing a, a, a manuscript now that we will be publishing. But this is uh, on the uh, y-axis, that's the percentage of deaths, and on the x-axis, that's age. And we can see that, unfortunately, for the American Indian population, the blue bars, we have a much higher percentage of our people dying at a younger age as compared to the percentage of deaths of the white population. You can see they really peak in the 80s. So if we look at the, the median or the mean, we're somewhere in the mid 50s for American Indians and nearly 80 for uh, the, the white population in North Dakota. So tremendous disparities, which is why it's important to take a holistic approach to understand what are the root causes of the age at death disparities, but even more importantly, what can we do about it? And I really believe that strengths within cultural connectedness and cultural practices are part of that equation. And, and those of you who have seen some of my presentations before know I, I tell this story a lot, but there's a, a brief story just about um, historical lessons and, and things we can learn about our health and life ways. And the, the story is, of three sisters walking along a river. And as they're walking along the river, they see babies and young children in the water struggling to stay afloat. So the first sister declares that this is an emergency, it's a crisis, we need to get the babies out of the water right now. The second sister thinks about that and says, no, we need to teach the babies how to swim so they can survive while they're in the water. And the third sister keeps walking upstream and the other two get angry with her and say, where are you going? Why aren't you helping us? And she says, I'm going to find out who's putting these babies in the water and I'm going to stop them. And that literally is working further upstream and focusing on public health and prevention. But I would put forth for indigenous populations, upstream uh, goes even beyond prenatal time frame. It's actually intergenerational. And that's the work that we're trying to do is have a better understanding of that real upstream impact and intergenerational impact on the health disparities that we deal with now. But as we go along that journey and identify those connections, what's even more important is that we identify culturally relevant and meaningful solutions to the health disparities that we face. So i would shown this uh, slide toward the beginning of our day together uh, today, just looking at some of our programming at UND. Of course, we have our Indians into Medicine program in Med that will be 50 years old next year. We've now graduated over 260 American Indian and Alaska Native physicians, our Indigenous Health MPH and our Indigenous Health PhD program. And then of course, today you heard more details on our Indigenous Trauma and Resilience Research Center. I did just briefly wanna talk about our Indigenous Health PhD. We have several students uh, who are uh, participating in the study to, or the uh, symposium today. Uh, but just looking at our, our curriculum and understanding that what we're doing at UND on the clinical training side is in med, but on the research training side is our PhD program. And we, we've needed this type of a curriculum. Um, and, and I'm not sure why other universities have not yet done this. I know there's a couple that are in process, but we have to understand the principles of indigenous health and understand the impact of colonization. But even more importantly, what are the resilience and strength-based approaches that we can leverage to improve health in our populations? And then we have applied biostatistics and applied epidemiology, where we also want to use data sets that include indigenous data and really understand the basic language of research. And then it is methods heavy. We have quantitative, qualitative, and mixed methods research. We have a CBPR and tribally driven research frameworks. I think that um, our programs here really are uh, CBPR, community-based and participatory. And I really love uh, the way Dr. Running Bear's project has evolved to really be driven by tribal priorities. And as we've mentioned, we've had research methods in indigenous populations for millennia. We might've had different methodologies and different terminology, but it is research and it is valid. So we have coursework in indigenous research methods, as well as American Indian health policy and indigenous health policy from more of an international perspective, then public health program evaluation and indigenous evaluation frameworks and indigenous leadership and ethics. So our curriculum is available uh, uh, through Zoom. So our students are all over the US and Canada. We've had two cohorts start the program. Our, our second cohort is just now finishing their first year. But we've now matriculated 34 students into our PhD, and we have an additional 14 that will be starting in August. So we're at nearly 50 Indigenous Health PhD students, and they're all over the US and Canada. 
and we've just really been uh, very pleased with the quality of students. And what's exciting to me is that these young, intelligent, vibrant uh, students, the uh, majority are indigenous, but not all of them. We have a lot of non-indigenous allies, but they're, they're so committed to this work. I've, I really feel uh, hopeful for the future. And I think it's incumbent on us and academics to provide good training programs to make sure that we have just absolute armies of well-trained researchers and people who can address the issues. Also, one thing we're very proud of also is the numbers of indigenous people who are now on faculty with us at UND. You've been able to hear from several of them today. In addition to myself, we have Dr. Melanie Nadu, who's Ojibwe from Turtle Mountain, PhD and MPH in epidemiology from University of Minnesota. Uh, there's less than 10 PhD prepared in American Indian or Alaska Native uh, epidemiologists. And we got to hear from uh, Mandy today, who's one of the very few with those that training. You heard from Drs. Redvers and Running Bear and Dr. Kelleher. In addition, we have Dr. Kyle Hill, who's Ojibwe, Dakota, and Lakota. He's got his PhD in clinical psychology and his master of public health from Johns Hopkins. And then our newest faculty member as of this week, Julie Yelanimi, who's Ojibwe from the White Earth Nation. She has training in psychology as well as public health. So we, we're very pleased with the, our indigenous faculty, but uh, in addition, we'll be hiring an, an in-med co-director and, and pleased to announce that we have two more tenure track faculty lines that we will be advertising here in the next couple of weeks. So if you have uh, people who might be interested in joining our faculty, it's a vibrant team with a lot of exciting opportunities. And in addition to our indigenous faculty, you've been able to hear from other uh, individuals who are really just key allies in this work and doing really meaningful things. And you got to hear from Dr. Andrew Williams, a really wonderful background in maternal and child health and public health, and I think is going to do some groundbreaking research to really improve the, the way we do prenatal care and early child care and try to really improve those outcomes that we're, we're dealing with. Uh, Dr. Amber Lyon Colbert, she's got a background in environmental health, has been a wonderful uh, teacher and uh, advisor to our students. Dr. Shonda Schrader, uh, I know she was on earlier, not sure if she's still on, but she's another one of our assistant professors and is a wonderful research methodologist and an outstanding instructor. And then our staff um, with Ashley, uh, she's now Ashley Bain, not Evenson anymore. Zana Sinnott and Christina Olafsson, and, and I need to add uh, Christina Beiswinger, Dr. Beiswinger is our COBRE uh, uh, project uh, program manager and, and does a lot of work with our research programs. But just our team is wonderful and I wanted to acknowledge each of them and thank all of them for their hard work and dedication to this uh, effort. And I would like to end these discussions with this image. And, uh, much of what we do in our indigenous uh, cultures and ways is learn from the natural world. We take a lot of lessons from the natural world. And in this area of the, the country, we have a lot of bison herds. And what we observe is that during the storms and during the blizzards, it's the strongest bison that face, stand, face the storm. They stand facing the storm. And their purpose is to protect those who are behind them, those who might not be as strong or might not be able to uh, take care of themselves or might have vulnerabilities. And I see that as our role in academics and in indigenous health is that for those of us who have the privilege and the honor to be able to stand and face the challenges, that's our responsibility because we have generations of people who are depending on this work to make an impact and improve uh, the lives and outcomes for future generations. So I'll pause uh, there. That's my email address, very simple, donald.warren at und.edu. Um, and uh, if there's any last questions or comments, um, please just raise your hand or put something in the chat if you're able to. Um, and let's see, Kathy, I'm not sure if that's from the previously or if you had your hand up again, I'm not sure. I didn't have my hand up, but I just want to say this has been fantastic. I really enjoyed it. It's been extremely informative and thank you to everyone that's presented. Great. And thank you for uh, uh, all of your uh, kind comments and, and discussion. I think there's a lot of really good collaborations that will be generated out of this. And um, all right, if you can, here's scan this QR code. 
um, or complete the conference survey. Um, the, also within the program booklet that you received, uh, there is a link for um, evaluation and we want to uh, have continuous quality improvement with our programming. So we'd love to hear from you and your thoughts regarding um, the, this symposium, but also suggestions for uh, future work and ideas that you may have. See, Dr. Beisminger, any um, last thoughts or comments in terms of the next steps for participants? I'm just, thank you all for attending and yeah, please do complete the survey. Uh, and for, if you missed any portions of it, we did record it and it'll be posted on the website later next week. All right, not seeing any hands up or questions. We'll go ahead and um, uh, end the symposium there, but uh, Wopila, Lila Wopila Tanka, thank you all very much. Uh, we appreciate your participation and look forward to collaborating with you in any way that we can. Have a good rest of your day.